And I want you to know that um, I didn't miss out on the several references you made to 8-Bit. And we don't we don't <laughs> talk about your shit until after we talk about our shit. That's bullshit. <laughs> and we're going to do this now. Hello and welcome to the Ritual Misery Podcast, episode 114 for Thursday, the 9th of February, 2017. This is a show where two lifelong friends talk about geek stuff and whatever else comes to mind. We also like to 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 cut off our guest, Vincent 404, <laughs> Roberto Villegas. How are you doing tonight? Now that the soundboard finally worked. <laughs> it's okay. Doing, doing good. Doing good. Uh, I was about to go into a rant uh, of what a 16-bit value is and that's the only other value that I know off the top of my head um but i'll stop it there i'll stop talking about unsigned and signed integers for hey, now Ken, because that's you, where my brain doing, goes man? oh my god man <laughs> this is the, the most fun i've had all week this is fantastic hey um uh, for, for 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 sure so we were having some issues some technical issues we got everything yeah. going good then roberto tried to call in he was having some technical issues, had to reboot his computer, and then after everything was going good, I had to rejigger my soundboard on my iPad four times before the button finally worked to start the show. <laughs> and Roberto just kept talking. <laughs> kept talking. That's, look, that's it, you can you can it is safe to assume that if there's a microphone in front of me and dead air needs to be filled, I will continually talk into the microphone until told otherwise. <laughs> or just awesome. or, or or until the theme music plays. Oh man. Until something happens, I will <laughs> so keep talking to this sucker. So something I want to point out in, in the pre show for uh, uh, patrons, you will be able to get the full pre and post show of this episode. Uh, Roberto told a UDP joke, which we're not gonna tell here. We're gonna save it for the patrons. But I will point out that random in the chat said I would tell you a UDP joke, but you might not get it. But um, <laughs> didn't. Yeah. So anyway, <laughs> hey, where, are, where are we going? Where are the rails? The there were rails here. We had rails. Like where are the rails? <laughs> uh, you you got to code them in Ruby. But Roberto, welcome to RMP. Oh my God, this, this is going to be a great we episode. We have been meeting for months and months and months to get on the show, and finally here you are. Thank goodness the circle is complete. So it's, it's funny welcome. because uh, and 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 I, I will put this out here because chances are someone will hear it. Uh, it's far easier to book me than people think it is. All, all they have to do is ask, and chances are I'll do it because I have no shame. I, I <laughs> I've learned from 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 the greats that you know as as you're kind of small or whatever, you just say yes, I'll be on there. Sure, why not? Who cares? Because, it, you know, either A, it'll be some, you know, because in my opinion, I never quite know who it is I'm going to interact with that is going to be that thing that's going to either A, get me to the next level or be someone I'll need to have in the back pocket for something, you know, for like, yeah. oh, hey, yeah, that sort of thing. So it's one of those, you know, it's one of those sort of things. I'm like, yeah, I'll totally be on. Oh, man. Awesome. So, yeah, you, you are now on the short list of, oh, shit, we don't have a guest this week. Who can we get? <laughs> I'm on a couple short lists for that, for ironically <laughs> enough, uh, and it's one of those weird things. It's just like, yeah, you know, totally. Like if I, and again, if it's like I, I'm busy, cool, then that sort of thing happens. But it's like usually I'm, I'm not busy, so yeah, I'm, uh, I, I will do my best to be on these sort of things. Are you uh, a sports ball guy? Do you watch sports? Sports. What's ball. funny? No, I'm not. But I, I, I always find sports fascinating. Like um, recently, I mean, I say recently, but like in the past, you know, a couple months. I have been just decimating watching all the ESPN 30 for 30s. And ah. holy crap, are those all solid docs. Like, they're first off solid documentaries, each and every one of them. Um, but it's it's learning about certain things I didn't quite know about in sports. Because I, I know, like, I always get a gleaming kind of glance on sports and sort of understand, you know, yes, I know what baseball is and basketball and all these sort of things. Could I give any specifics? No, not at all. But... Why do you ask, out of curiosity? Well, there was a major sporting event. <laughs> oh, yeah, there was that Super Bowl thing that happened <laughs> yeah. where, where, where I understand, and from what I understand, from the information I gleaned from Twitter and everything else, the most boring team won the Super Bowl because they've won, won it five times in the past. 
Which, which to me, that, that this is what, what's kind of weird about that mentality of sports. Maybe you can explain to me this, who watch, those who watch sports. Why is it that we, like, because if you talk about anything else, like if, we're talk, if we were to, for example, let's say that, that Tom Brady had like, you know, was it Brady, right? Tom Brady? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. You know, um, was like a, an employee for a company. You know, you would want to know that, like, well, cool. We've had this guy on on staff for five years, and he's consistently done solid work. He's done above and beyond what we would deem a, as as a as the position he's in. You know, like this would be the kind of guy that you'd fast track. He he'd get stock options and do all the stuff that you know makes for a solid employee. Why is it that in sports, specifically in in, in football, that like that's deemed against the idea of like, well, he can't win that many times. He can't win five times. I'm like, but that's that's what he's paid to do. That's that's why they they paid him. That's why they continue to pay him because if he didn't win, they would just let him go and, and pay somebody else. Hopefully. Yeah. See, I, I don't know. I, I tend to look at sports kind of like politics where like we're all, we're very tribal when it comes to uh, politics and sports, I would say in equal measure. And when l- l- like, let's say, all right, we just had um, two straight terms of a democratic president. Right. And now we have a Republican president. Where it, if we had gotten a Democratic president for a third straight term, there would be a lot of people that would be pissed off just because we can't have the same party in power constantly, you know. And it's kind of the same thing when it comes. God, to it's, it's, that, it's so funny that like we as Americans do that because like yeah. um, in Mexico, I think for the longest time, uh, one of the uh, I forget what party it was had somebody in in like the higher ground for as many years even in japan is that way like other countries kind of do this it's it's so weird that we have that mentality of politics being similar to sports because you're absolutely right that sports is very tribal like no matter what sport it is whether it be football uh soccer hockey curling any any of those sports like even esports has those kind of things where you follow certain teams and kind of latch on to figures because i think that's what's I think that's the interesting part of of sports that no one really talks about is the idea is the story. And I think that's why like I I've tend to latch on to the documentaries, specifically the 30 for 30s, just because yeah. you know, like I like like one of my favorite eras of basketball, especially the one I grew up with, because I you know, I was from Michigan and um so my team was the Detroit Pistons, uh, was the bad boy era. You know, like the okay. Bill Ambeer, Isaiah Thomas, Joe Dumars, yeah. all these kind of, you know, these you know, Dennis Rodman, you know, names that are, that are burned in my head. Of like these characters, um, I mean, it's so funny because I, I I don't I didn't really put all this together as a kid until later on. But like I had owned, uh, I guess my parents bought it for me for for a Christmas gift. Uh, I had uh, like the only sports game I think I have owned besides maybe Tecmo Bowl, not Tecmo Bowl. Uh, j- uh, sorry, Joe Montana's football on the NES. Uh, oh, oh, the only other okay. sports game I've ever owned uh, for the Super Nintendo. Was Bill Lambeer's Combat Basketball? <laughs> yes, I remember that game. Oh, horrible game, horrible game, terrible game. Very, very but bad a game. A plus the concept. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, exactly. The concept's amazing. Horribly executed, but you know, I mean, there's there are those, you know, there are are, are those weird sports games that happened during that era. From and, I, and and I'm not even talking like Shaq Fu. I'm talking like uh, Michael Jordan in the Windy City, the a platformer, uh, mm-hmm. where you're Michael Jordan, you know. Yeah, dunking yeah. at random basketball hoops throughout <laughs> Chicago that have no rhyme or reason to be where they are. Um, but I've always found, like, again, the story's far more fascinating in all these kind of dynasties and stuff like that. And, and, you know, you talk about, like, certain teams and certain characters, like, you know, and I think that's, I think for me, that's what I've liked about sports. Because, like, those are things I, I think I, I remember more. Like, you don't, t- like, if you talk about, like, tennis Yes, you know, we know like Agassiz and certain things, but even like like John McEnroe, I always remember like, you know, that guy just, you well, know. That's why, that's why I tend to latch on to baseball, uh, which is very unpopular amongst like all of my friends. Um, only a few of my family members actually like baseball. But baseball is all, to me, is all about the stories. Because yep. you don't remember, like, remember that one time where that guy ran to second base? Like, nobody, nobody gives a shit. It's all about the stories and like the, Anything from the the storytelling of the game itself, like the, uh, you, you know, you can have different things like you know a David versus a Goliath. You can have a uh, yep. you know the comeback story. You can have all these different things within the game itself. But then if you look at the, the like the team lore as a as a whole, like the Cubs won the World World Series last year, and it was a big 
story about the you know breaking the curse of the goat and all of that sort of stuff There's right so and all, all these sort of things that, and, that you know yeah. uh, it, it's it that's what fascinates me a lot with sports is that I, I will always latch on the story i will always watch those sort of things the actual game itself i never really care about because <laughs> i never have i never have enough invested to the game to watch it but um, and I, because I thought like I thought one of the most brilliant things that any sports, you know, uh, big giant organization did uh, was what NFL did with Directv and and basically their red line TV, where it's like every Sunday you flip on this one feed, and no matter what, it'll cut to whatever game is right there at the moment of like yeah. we're about to score the most important you know the the critical moment of of any any football game is right. like all right yeah. folks we're going to cycle it like it's it's my my all-time <laughs> favorite thing because it's just it 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 cuts out all the faff if you will it just gets to where like you know you're like all right let's see if they score cool i get to put my fantasy fo- my, my fantasy football check mark boom boom done out of here <laughs> um amos what was your thoughts of the super bowl this week um uh... So I was really, really excited. I thought the first half was really fun, um, mostly because uh, like fifty three percent of the country, I'm a Patriots hater. Um, don't really care about the Dirty Birds. Don't really give a shit. But yeah, you know, I mean, my t- my team doesn't have a chance and won't have a chance for another five years or something like that. The team that I I follow ish. <laughs> Overall, I enjoyed the performance by Lady Gaga. So, <laughs> what the hell is the deal with like? Do people just want to hate on shit to hate on shit? Because I, I've, I, I heard isn't all that, of, isn't that like the default, so, like the default thread of the internet as, as right, sad as no, it sounds. Exactly. This this one was so like we specific were, though. Like people super- people were hating on it, saying, "Oh, next year's got to be Metallica and then Pantera." And I'm like, those aren't mainstream. And if they've ever played the super, like if if Metallica was ever gonna play, it would have been in Levi Stadium last year in San right. well, in Santa Clarita. Or Santa right, Clara. Right, right, right. I mean, that would that's when it would have happened, but it didn't. Why? Because nobody wants to watch Metallica play at the Super Bowl. What are they gonna get? Like one song in? I mean, come on, they're gonna go out there and play Justice Medley. That, that's <laughs> that, that's all they have. They 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 don't have anything that's like really quick, really hit, really pop. Okay, done, done, done. Moving on, moving on, moving on. Well, one thing that one thing that stuck out to me, you when you said Lady Gaga. So when we Steph and I went to a Super Bowl party. And neither one of us had any sort of investment in in the teams. It was just like, you know, we're, we're going to watch the Super Bowl because we always watch the Super Bowl. But we went to someone's house, and it was great. We got to interact with with friends and meet a lot of new people and eat some good food and stuff like that, good beer, et cetera. Well, anyway, the halftime show comes on, and the buzz in the house, there's probably like 20 or 30 people there. The buzz was like, oh, wow, she looks really good. Like, check her out. She's, you know, it looks like she's – like there was that uh, one outfit she was wearing where she was showing her abs. Like I heard somebody say, like, like, oh wow, look, she's pretty cut up. Fast forward to this week on the internet, everybody's like, oh my god, did you see how fat Lady Gaga is? And wow, that's, she let herself that's, go. That's actually what my daughters were saying. They're like, oh my god, she's gotten so chubby. And I'm what like, are you talk? She weighs like 120 but pounds. Here, here's the thing that gets me though. Here's the thing that gets me. She could come out there in the Super Bowl with. Literally live babies strapped to her breasts, and 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 like like puppies hanging from her butt, and it'd be okay because Lady Gaga is all about acceptance. So I think the <laughs> thing that I I, I give Gaga um, props on, and it's something that I think is important um, to to talk about, is oh God, save the straps, save the, save save the cables. Well, well, I'll put it this way. Um, <laughs> Rarely in music, especially now, especially in pop, do we discuss the idea of the presentation, you know, um, especially when it comes to Super Bowl shows. Because usually, because no one, for example, in a Super Bowl show is ever going to question, well, that person could sing well or, or, or talk about the technicalities of, of, of vocal performance, which you should, but that's not, you know, that's not what people go for. And that's fine. Totally cool. What I give Gaga props on, especially as her being a performer, is that she is not afraid to say, all right, I've got 15 minutes. I'm gonna wow everybody. Because even I watched that. I'm not the biggest, you know, Super Bowl guy, or even not the biggest that. But like, it's a, it was an amazing performance. And it's a, you know, it's she definitely she has a, a showmanship. She has the way of of making her shows as they should be, specifically for live things, an experience. 
you know, and she does a damn good job of that. And and it's a one thing I will give Lady Gaga props, even though I'm not the biggest fan of her music, I commend her for injecting sort of what we typically call pop music with this little bit of eccentricity, but it, it just adding this level of just like, wow, just the technical feat that goes into, because I know, you, you know, no one really thinks about a live show, um, but everything has to hit right away because mm -hmm. if you screw up, you light a guy's hair on fire that he has to spin. And, and just because that guy can spin because he's the king of pop, he can put it out. <laughs> right. You know? Because the thing is, is that uh. when we talk about things, you know, if you think about performances, uh, especially Super Bowl performances, you never talk about, wow, that was a solid performance. You always talk about the, oh, did you see the wardrobe malfunction? Oh, did you see X, Y, or Z? Or, man, that guy, you know, like, like I remember like one year, like Bon Jovi, I think, didn't, like, was performing. It's like, man, Bon Jovi was terrible this time around. Like, we always talk about the terrible stuff. We never talk about the, wow. That was a solid performance. They're and, still and talking wowed. about Justin Timberlake pulling off uh, 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 yeah. Janet Jackson's boob cover, yeah. which happened in yeah. like 94 or some shit. And it was clearly <laughs> planned because she had a pasty on her nipple. Like, no, okay, I mean, exactly. Regardless, but, I, mean, I mean, but that's the thing. We talk about those moments. And, and so for me, I, I always appreciate Gaga as, even though I'm not, I'm not necessarily number one for her music, she... She knows how to work a crowd. She knows how to make a performance. She knows how to how to mm -hmm. how to how to tell a story. I mean, she's she is the modern day Madonna, you know, in terms of 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 how you do that stuff. You know, she yep. took she basically looked at the Madonna playbook, said, okay, well, how can I apply this to now, and moved on. Yeah. Speaking and, yeah, of and playbooks and, and how to apply them exactly. to now. Spe speaking of playbooks and how to, how to apply them to now. Daily Politico, are you like a like what, what's going on with this man? Like, how, so, how's your week been? Uh, Apparently you've been a little, I, little uh, obsessive? Well, <laughs> well, so, ever since the election last year, um, one of the sites that's become kind of my go-to every day, no, no matter what, I wake up, is politico.com. Uh, it has become my, it's, it's weird, because it, it, it wasn't in, until about, I'm going to say, Let's see. The election was November, so I guess October or September. I probably I started going, you know, there. But now it's become this like ritual of like I wake up, I go to Politico, I see it. I, I see an alert from CNN. I go to Politico to, to either a get some better context or b just get get a sort of a, a quick overview. I get it. I, I look at I look at a tweet. I, I see. I look at a Facebook post. I immediately go to Politico, try to find the actual news article, sort of based on this. Like it's become but this. You like, use it as Snopes, then. So it's become it's 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 my like again. It is my weirdly default sh site. It would, has come would, to the would point you say where it's, would you say it's become your ritual misery? I don't know because I actually enjoy it. I enjoy it in a weird way. I realize you're trying to tie it to the title, but like I actually, like, it's become this. Like I realize, like let's see, I'm gonna I'm gonna put a new tab on Safari here and tell you the sites that are that are 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 here for bookmarked. Politico is one of my sites. CNN's another one. Twitch is there. I then have PVP, the the comic, YouTube, and then my banks and other social networks and and uh, the 2016 movie draft because that spreadsheet I often I often refer to at least on a weekly basis. So yeah, it's it's bizarre how often i go to politico and and like how much i know and i realized that um this past week as my parents were in town and i was talking to my dad about the you know that everything goes on because you know we always have that kind of conversations and i mentioned politico and he's like what's that i go like well let me tell you about what politico is it's like this really deep in the weeds politics thing like to the point where like i know certain things i should i didn't know last year like i know like who's being confirmed why they're being confirmed what the issues everybody has like it's it's bizarre and mind-boggling how much i know about politics now political i never heard of political i don't know how old it is but i'd never heard of it until last year like middle of last year is probably it's like, an older from, site i've always from known its existence i think but, didn't, you know, it, didn't it wasn't it formed by like people that left the washington post i think so again i don't know really history and it's it's one of those things i should probably look into because it it it's the been around for a I while like, the thing that I like about Politico is that it's a, it's a no spin thing because like if you want to learn about politics and you go to CNN, you're gonna get the left spin. If you go to Fox News, you're gonna get the far right spin. Right. You know. But you go to Politico and it's like they're not like 
they're not using adjectives like terrible and and amazing. It's right. just like this guy did this thing. Right. Um, and it's be- and it's becoming to the point where um cuz like the weird thing about this uh you know the current cycle that we live in right now when it comes to news and this is me being very very cagey in terms of 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 diplomatic and stuff like that. Um we're at a point now where a lot of po- political news Almost mirrors game news in terms of that. If you think of of a, of of you know previous game sort of video game news, uh, a tweet could be an entire news article on Kotaku. Um, yes, you know, and right. we're now at a point where a tweet can be an entirely news article on CNN. You know, it can be be front page news on the Washington. You know, the 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 Washington Post it can be part of a a a, a Wall Street Journal. Or, you know, uh, you know, op ed. And uh, not and, just can, but is almost daily now right right exactly and and it becomes part of this thing and so for me a lot of a lot of it going politico became this sort of idea of like well i need something that's going to cover this cycle of news i have sort of sites that kind of cover things like i use cnn as my quick broad overview of what's happening in the world not not so much getting in depth not so much you know that just give me these quick overview of like here are the things i need to look into in depth um, I use The Verge as my quick overview of the, of, of tech. Mm-hmm. I use Polygon as my my in depth kind of you know game video video game coverage stuff. I use Ars Technica as my 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 quick overview of Infosec and kind of other tech stuff. I and then I even go to Japan Times to get a quick you know overview of what's happening in Asia and BBC for what's happening in the Europe. So I have like a lot of these sites that are are kind of these quick overviews. And Politico has become my just all right. I need to know what's happening in U.S. politics today. Everything that's going down. Boom. Go there. Get all get all the reports, every every bit of it. Click into each article. Things that catch my eye, things that don't. Because again, it's it's it becomes that part of of my news gathering rituals, so I know all the stuff. Right, yeah. right, right. Yeah. So you sound like a news junkie like me. Um, but you you were talking about going to Japan Times for uh, news about what's going on in Asia. You were in Japan. Yes. Fairly recently. Yeah, I was actually there last September. Um. What's funny is prior to going there, Japan Times had become sort of this article, mainly because I have a, of a friend of mine. It's funny how many people are talking in the chat room talking about the uh, about the fact that I'm going from sports to politics, and now I'm going to talk about my trip to Japan and everything else. <laughs> but I, I had been reading Japan Times uh, for a while, mainly because I had a friend of mine uh, – I say friend, more of an acquaintance from South By that I'd see every year – uh, that wrote for it, and that's where I was like, and I got kind of quoted in one of the articles about Japan Night um, in there. Um, but it's 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 one of those sites for me that because I have enough friends there, and as a guy that was traveling there, I was like, well, let me at least understand where the hell I'm going to beyond just the idea of like, well, here's a tourist place. Like, no, let me let me you know capture things. Says, let me tell you, um, going on a trip to Japan, you actually get a quick lesson in 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 world economics. Uh, without even trying, because you have to, you you start to learn about safe haven currencies, and why it is the yen and the dollar fluctuate so crazily, and everything else because of weird things like, um, you know, um, never mind. I'm not even. Gonna, <laughs> right. I'm, I'm, I'm 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 pulling I'm pulling we, out of that because I'm like I'm about to talk about monetary easing, and it's just we, like uh, yeah, yeah. great. We, we, talk we, about something kids, more, yeah. more simple, like the Japanese language. Do you, <laughs> yeah, just, Japanese. Yeah. Kent and I both lived in Japan for four years, and holy crap! Like it's seeing the ebb and flow of the dollar versus yen was like because our paychecks yeah. changed according to what the yen rate was. Yep. Or the well, you, rate, you, you, it's it? it's it, the reason why that's the case is that uh, the yen is a safe haven currency, you know, and and what that means is that um, this is going to get a little bit weird, uh, e- economically geeky. Uh, if <sighs> let's say, for example, that like like the idea being that the yen tends to keep its value, meaning that if I if I put 100 yen here, chances are it's not really going to raise or fluctuate. It's kind of like a blue chip stock. It'll change, and if it ever changes, it just gets stronger, and if it weakens, it doesn't weaken a heck of a whole lot, so you don't lose a heck of a lot. So the idea being is that when sh- when things are crazy in the world in terms of econo- e- economy, you put your money in Japan, you leave it there for, you know, until things kind of settle down, and you take it out, and you maybe made a little bit of money back, maybe you lost a little bit of money, but you didn't, you know, you didn't lose tremendously there's, a whole yeah, lot. Or you there's didn't no gain. catastrophic losses. Right, exactly, and that's something important when you talk about you know money because again, the only things that tend to really appreciate in value are gold, and gold's a bit of a a clun, you know a kludgy kind of thing to have. And then you talk talk about double gold and the idea of no, again, no, all no. This stuff I, like- I like the idea that gold's a bit of a cunt. I like I something about that. <laughs> well, it's it's it's, <laughs> it, it's 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 not that it, it's one of those currencies, those things that's like man. 
because even that has a weird thing of like you can buy stock in gold and and that you can even like buy stock in shorting gold and yeah. and it's just like man that's a level i i i, I can only kind of gleam from my, like reading it but because when you travel japan and i had to kind of plan for this trip um it became me watching that daily rate and I needed to understand what affected that rate. Why is it that this rate is going down? Why is it going up? Even, when you're even planning- though you know you probably have zero chance of actually positively affecting it for yourself. You right. It's, know more of, why. it's more of a I need to know how much money I need to save because Japan's a cash-oriented country, and I need to have some yeah. cash on me so I can spend it on the trip and, and actually be okay. It had nothing to do with that. And so because you're planning a trip for a year, it's like, well, I got to save this much money per day and all this stuff like that. And so I learned a lot about how it is that, you know, the economy work in Japan. And because it's, you know, it, it became the sort of thing that affects all the other world, other countries, I started learning a lot about the, the economy. So when around that time, when I came back from before the trip, uh, this is the greatest moment because I told my, my friend, uh, my friend Claudia came on the other trip. My, uh, she, she kind of hitched a ride in terms of the whole thing. Uh, when I told her the rate, uh, I, I showed her because I was explaining to it. I, I showed her this like graph off of, I think the, uh, I think it's XE is the uh, currency site. And I told her, see yeah. if you can figure out when Brexit happened, mm. uh, because you just see you just see the you, you see the like the tick mark of 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 the end of dollar like the dollar was like here like it was like in the twenties and the fifteen and then it just went down <laughs> and yeah. down yep. and down it went because it became this you know because let me tell you uh, economists hate uncertainty and, and unknown variables because we like to compute things and figure now, it out on on uh, on on Japan being a cash economy. A cash-oriented economy. I've been to a, a, several countries where it's like, oh, you you, here's the price. If you pay cash, um, or if you pay credit, it'll cost you a little bit more. You know, the the, the price is yeah. is three euros, but if you pay credit, it's it's three fifteen. You know, um, Japan on the other hand, they put the prices on there, expecting you to use credit, and then you get a discount if you use cash. And if you're using yen. It's the best best discount ever. It's like sometimes buying, depending on what you're buying, of course, but if you're buying dinner, you can get a 20% discount if, just by paying yen instead of using credit. Like, it's, it it's was, amazing. It was amazing going uh, in the country. Um, like, the one thing that I can say about, uh, about Japan as a place to visit, um, it was really cool being able to kind of walk into a place and, and for the most part, never having a bad food experience. Um, you know, and, and not paying a heck of a lot. Like it was one thing like everyone, cause everyone, the one thing people talk about when it comes to Japan is that they always say it's very expensive and it's yes and no, I will never, I will not lie. It is a very pricey ticket to get there. It is not a cheap ticket. There's, you know, there are ways of getting it cheaper, but it's not, it's still a good chunk of change in the end of it all. You can probably get a ticket. I think now for about 800, um, depending on when you go, yeah. uh, it's still good, but it's still expensive. It's still a good chunk of change no matter what. Right. I like the fact um, that it's sometimes cheaper to go through Hawaii than to go direct because Hawaii is yes. such a touristy place. <laughs> like exactly, I get to no, go no, to Japan that's why. And I there, have to stop by Hawaii. Many oh, ways no. to to do it. Um, <laughs> but um, when it comes to going to Japan and paying for food, uh, I I never like I, when we were over there. I was like, this is about as much as I pay for food in in Austin. You know, it wasn't terribly much more. Hmm. The kicker was obviously is if you're there. And you're you're wanting to eat more American food and stuff like that. Yeah, it's gonna cost more. But if you're like me and you already like sushi and you like ramen and you and you don't really care what you're you're, you're what particularly you do is you go to the latte mart and buy a bento box. Yes, <laughs> that's, that's Fam, family mart, family mart, uh, 7-Eleven. Seven Eleven there is at an entirely different level than we are here in the states. Like like they have their game yep. down tight. Like to the point of. I think we we're on. I think we we're actually going in one of the the, the subway chains. I think it was the. The JR. Uh, so in in Japan, the, there's uh, various kind of sub subway companies and rail companies, uh, all birthed out of the uh, original JR line. The government ran one, and they've all been privatized. Whatever. Um, it was a JR. I think it was the Yamato line, sort of the one that kind of circles around Tokyo. Uh, and I, you know, I, they had all these ads kind of going on television screens. And one of them I caught was a 7-Eleven ad, where I was I wasn't reading it. I couldn't understand it because I couldn't hear it. But I could gleam what it was because you saw all these like different farms and and like different locations. And, like, oh, they're talking about how they get fresh food for their Seven Elevens from various parts of Japan, and that that, that they care about their ingredients and that make quality products, yeah. which they do. 
Um, because you go into a Seven Eleven and it is like a la- a level different for food. Like you go there, it is there's fresh food, you, there's rice balls, there are sushi. You it's have amazing. the you have the same problem there that you have in in Korea though, which is you don't want to go into a Japanese or a Korean Seven um, uh, Eleven or any mart for that matter, and try to find toothpaste because you're just as likely to end up with hernia cream. Um, just <laughs> throwing that out there, like it's it's a known thing. Yeah. <laughs> is this a personal experience, Amos? I'm not saying it's not. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. There are, oh, like, there, there are things that you have to – I mean, again, it, it's it, it's uh, one of those countries I, I, I do want to go back to again. I probably will figure out another uh, year. Probably I'm, I'd like to go back next year, but i got to figure out some other things first. But it was a fun – it's one of those places that I, I recommend you go either before or after 2020, though. Um, because uh, mm. summer 2020, oh, I mean, I'm, I love yeah, Japan. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I would no, n- no. Not, but if you go after, chance. it's fine. Cause I'll tell you, cause the thing is, is that if you go before, um, this is the one thing I, I, I told my friends this when we we're going was that this is the perfect time to go because we're going to get all the advantages of them having to build out things for tourists, not just simply like make things English, whatever, but like add features and, and build out yep. hotels. And as we get closer and closer to, to the Olympics, it's going to get better. And so long as we don't go during the Olympics, we're good. If we go well, after the Olympics, we then get everything good. So, yeah. here's, here's another thing though. If you go there now and you're going to be there for any period of time, you might be able to convince one or two people that you're there scouting for Olympic teams. And they might yeah. treat you extra nice. I'm not saying that I've done something it's, like that. It's, I'm hey, just, look, it, it, either way, it's, I'm an it's idea a, bot. I mean, That's what I do. I kick out the ideas, and y'all nah, decide if they're good or not. <laughs> totally fine. U- ultimately, there are are, are a whole. Um, it, there's a there's a lot of uh, again. It's it's one of those things. One of the places. It's it's a great great country to go to. Um, and like I said, Seven Eleven is a great. You know, it, it's because again, there are ways to eat on the cheap. Like I was with uh with Tom. Tom Merritt was was luckily was at the exact same time I was there in Japan. Name uh, dropper. Kind of after the fact. Um, because we I I had planned a separate thing, and he just was like, I'm going to Japan at the same time, like rock and roll. So we ended up meeting up. Um, and it's like the trick of it, of like you go to a family mart, um, and you go there and you buy a bento box and you have lunch for like you know, at the most you know seven bucks, you know, and, and yeah. you translate the the yen to dollar at the time, and it's just like this yeah, is it's awesome. Like a full meal. It's not like a lunchable. It's like a no, full- no, yeah, and that's the thing, and and it's a quality thing, and that's what's yeah. what's bizarre and strange because. You know, you talk to any American and you explain, yeah, I'm eating food from 7-Eleven. You know, you think of like that the hot dog spitting. Yeah, that, that, chicken. That, yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah. You think, a, a you think about that, that hot dog spitting or that random that burrito that doesn't quite look like a burrito. That looks like it kind of was in the deep fryer a little too long and somehow transformed <laughs> to something else. But you still have to question and go like, hmm, maybe, maybe, I don't know. Okay, never mind. I'll just grab the burger instead. As a you 7-Eleven know. in Japan or Korea or Family Mart or whichever variety you want to go to is more yeah. like a miniature H-E-B than yes. it is a, a a quickie mart like it's it's, well, it's even, a genuine even, even place then, like all the department stores there and and this was like at every subway station at, at every train station every you know thing every one of those places had like a, their bottom floor was like this delicatessen food you know dream in terms of like you yeah the top floors be like clothing and makeup and then somewhere on the bottom floor would be like cheese and random other vegetables. And they'd all be – it'd be weird. Every department store would have this. And and it was like very apparent. Like even one of the ones we had stumbled upon because we went to like a, a the the sort of camera store or the, the electronic store, the big one, a big camera, sort of equivalent like a Best Buy except if you had Best Buy merged with Toys R Us and somehow we added you know bicycles and stuff like that to it for no apparent reason. Um, <laughs> even uh, Even in those places, like you'd find the random floor and it's like – Welcome to the hundred yen store. It's like cool. Let's buy some other stuff oh, here. Oh my god, yen the hundred yen store. It, and That's, uh, I got all of my fishing gear from the one hundred yen store, including the hot dogs, including the bait. I mean, <laughs> yes, absolutely. We get I'll tell I'll tell one last story about about Japan because I know we got you know we, uh, there's other stuff in your in your in your dock that that you know out of that. Oh, but as, 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 I was thinking about this. Okay, real quick before you get to your story, I was thinking about it. And a lot of people will tune into specific episodes of our show because we put in the title the the name of the guest. Right. And with you, they're going to go in knowing that you're in the episode. And if they go into this episode <laughs> not expecting it to be two hours long, 
then they screwed up somewhere. Like that's just fact. It's that's, their fault. It's, it's their, their fault. That's like, fine. Look again. Like I'm, we warned them by putting I, your I name in the, the title. Ride. I will. I will. <laughs> I will slow down if I need to slow down. I'll ramp up if I need to ramp up. I'm. I'm. I'm, I'm here for the for the for the journey. You know, we can. We can. That's we like, can take the. You know. It, that's like we can either make. We got that. We can either a. You know, go go hyperspeed or you know. Uh, hey, by the way, super Bruno, tramp, take the long way home. Roberto, I got, I do got to tell you, Jackie Hearn warned us about having you on. <laughs> it's a, it's a bit of a thing because I tend to talk. Uh, Look, that's, if that's you, my, if I'm, you, I'm used to filling dead air. If you're, if you're watching this show or listening to this show, or you're on DiamondClub.tv and you're, you're watching slash listening in, in the chat room, if you, if you expect Vincent 404, Roberto Villegas, to be on the show and it not be a two-hour show. You are essentially setting yourself up the same way as if you're watching a Richard Gunther episode and not expecting someone to get pissed off and yell. Like <laughs> it's funny because like that's why I limit eight bit life to an hour and and I keep it that way because I could go on I could talk forever. Uh, anyways, so give the story really really quick. Um, only because it's actually an American story and it it has it's a it, only because when I came back from Japan uh, here in Austin Texas we have. Uh, the luck of having import stores, one of them being uh, Asahi. I think it's a uh, Asahi. I, uh, I'm about to double check my oh, the the beer. pronunciation. Mm -hmm. um, but this was the weird part about going into that um, store. Uh, and this is something if you've only been to Japan that you know, um, because it doesn't happen in the States and no one ever does this in the United States. Uh, whenever you go into a Japanese uh, supermarket, restaurant, whatever, doesn't matter whether you're going into the fanciest restaurants, the run, the random ramen house that you walked into, or if you just stopped by the family mart because you needed that herpy cream. I mean, toothpaste. <laughs> um, <laughs> every time the person behind there usually will greet you saying, Sumimasen, you know, welcome. Sumimasen. Hello. You excuse know, excuse me. Yeah, excuse yeah. me. Sumimasen. Sumimasen is this, this, this magical word. It's, that, it's that, like, it's that, like uh, aloha in Hawaii. Yes, like, it's yeah. got 50 a lot of meanings. It's, depending very on, good, it's all contextual. You know, it's a very good phrase to know. They uh, sing you it. Know. They sing it when you walk in. It's, <laughs> it's it. Yep, and it's a very important phrase to know. In fact, uh, there are only there are only <laughs> five to six words you need to know in Japanese to survive while you're there. Because luckily enough, there's a lot of pictures in all your in all your food restaurants. You need to know excuse me, which is sumimasen. Uh, you need to know how to say yes, hi. You need to say no, yeah. Uh, you need to say you need to know how to say uh, thank you. Arigato or domo arigato gozaimasu, you know, however you want to say it, uh, depending on how much inflection you want to do. Even domo saying, arigato, Mr. Roboto. <laughs> uh, and, and lastly, you know, how to say sorry, which is surprising enough, domo. Uh, once you know, and, and even things like, you know, even uh, you can kind of get away with not even knowing how to say hello per, per se, because it's depending on what time of day you might say it. Like you can get away with not knowing those sort of things because you can say sumimasen. Uh, and maybe learn what bathroom is, and even then, a lot of those things like, oh, you'll catch that key, that that key word or that key sign somewhere there, yeah. uh, and so the, like that. The one that I felt was necessary whenever I would go into a restaurant was hashi o kurasai, which means chopsticks, please. Mm. Because That's a good. They one. See that I'm a round eye, a white round eye. See, what's funny is that they they ne they never bought like they gave us like they <laughs> they they. they Got used to like oh chopsticks whatever because like, maybe I would just go to the places that would give me chopsticks because it would just like there's no other way to eat ramen like right, stupid yeah. Oregon. like I'm like yeah I fucking know that's why I have that's why I know what I'm doing like oh he's he's he's, he's Mexican he's fine uh, <laughs> no because seriously like the first time I ever had sushi in my entire life was in Mexico uh, in Puebla uh, with family and we're at a mall that was the first time I had I had sushi was in Mexico so uh, you mall know, go sushi mm. uh, but all that leads into when I walked into the import store for the first time and I just got back from the trip, you know, I was just, I was kind of like, it was like a, maybe a month later and I go in and I'm greeted with what word do you think? In wh wh where did you walk into? I missed in the, the Japanese import, import store, store here in Austin, Texas, right off Burnett. What word do you think I was greeted to by? Sumimasen. Yes. Sumimasen, like, like, like Love exactly it. as if I had never left the country. And I'm walking around and I'm seeing food up there. I'm seeing all the drinks I drank. I saw, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the Bakari sweat kind of, you know, drink and all these kind of like vitamin C things, like everything I'd bought, you know, maybe about like two or three weeks ago. And I'm like, this is awesome. This is amazing. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm seeing all that. I'm like, it's like, it's like, I never fucking left. It was just bizarre. Mm -hmm. It was so surreal. It was so bizarrely surreal. Just like seeing all these things and going like, okay, this is really 
fucking eerie and really <laughs> legit because it well, was just it. I didn't have to spend all that money to travel over the Pacific Ocean. I could have just drove across yeah. town. But but it's it's all about the legitimacy though. I mean, cuz if you no, if you, no, if, yeah. you ever, if you're just going to Vons and you're going to Ethnic Isle and you see a bunch of random lettered kind of stuff and you're like, "Oh, this is the Japanese blah 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 rice wine blah 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 blah." And you're using that and you're like, "Oh, this is so good. This is my Japanese recipe." Ah. Oh. And then you go over there and you eat it and you see what they're putting into it and you're like, this is this is this is not the same thing. <laughs> well, because like the thing about you know like like we're we're a little spoiled here in Austin in that we have like ramen tatsuya, which is actually really really good ramen, and it's as close here in Austin that you'll ever get to proper Japanese ramen in terms of like it's good and it's pretty much Japanese ramen proper. Like it's really damn good. We'll be to the, the point that we'll be the judge of that before. in four weeks. Well, I say that it is, and, and to the point of like my my you know uh, my my friend in Japan, Audrey uh, Audrey, uh, I think it's uh, Kimura. I'm, I'm gonna make sure I get her right her name right because she is an amazing person. Uh, the person that runs Japan Night, you know, person of Ben Ten Records. Um, even she and other people who come from Japan will will will, will sing the praises of uh, Ramen Tatsuya, and it's uh, yeah Kimura. There you go. Uh, you know. So I and I will say from personal experience, it is about as close. That that doesn't mean that it's the best ramen here in, in town, um, because it all depends on what you're trying to get. Like there's some places here, uh, like Michi Ramen um, tends to kind of, or even and Whole Foods will do this. Try to make sort of a little bit of a Texas spin on ramen, you know, by by using the idea that we have smoked meats uh, and that we have certain things that we can kind of do that that typically aren't you know done in traditional ramen. Um, but yep. you know, it all depends on what you're trying to look for. Um. Yeah. Go ahead, Amy. Uh, speaking of, of what, what you're looking for, uh, you continued to watch the OA. This yeah. Week. So I need to I need to issue a retraction. <laughs> so last night, <laughs> last or not last night, last week when we had Jenny Josephson on, I had seen the first couple episodes of the OA. Uh, real quick, Roberto, have you watched the OA on Netflix? I have not. Okay. So last week, I'd only seen the first couple episodes, and I was like. Oh my God, this show is amazing. You were excited enough about it that it made me put it on my short list of shit to watch. Yes. So the series is eight episodes long. The first seven episodes, I mean, I was just, I was so into it. I'm like, holy shit, I cannot stop watching this show. It's great. It's thought provoking. It's got this wonderful story. And then I watched episode eight <laughs> and fuck that show. Like, I am so <laughs> fucking mad at that show. They went seven episodes setting up this this beautiful narrative, just wonderful, just great story. And then episode eight burned all that shit to the ground. And <laughs> I'm so fucking mad. Fuck that show. Nobody watched the OA. Boycott the OA. It's garbage. Don't wow. Watch. Wow. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm seriously, I'm so mad. I was so mad I tweeted about that shit. <laughs> <laughs> That's that's like the epitome of anger, isn't it? Like when you're willing to sit down there, but you know what? I've only got 140 characters. I'm gonna compress this <laughs> anger and put it into <laughs> into text and shoot it out to the <laughs> entire world. Yes. God damn it, I was mad. <laughs> anyway, so let's move on because I'm just gonna spend the next 20 minutes bitching about the OA. Uh, Amos, you had something pretty cool happen to you this week. Um. So, uh, so some time ago, I was interviewed by the one and only Fitz in the chat room, and um, it finally it finally came to fruition. It was finally available out there in the world. And I got to tell you, the entire process of being interviewed, and the uh, the whole it was just it was kind of kind of surreal, and it ended up really good. Like I thoroughly enjoyed it. Now that might be a little narcissistic of myself, but I don't know. <laughs> Whatever, it's my show. So, um, <laughs> you do you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, except on Tuesdays. Um, it, it, I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the process of it. I thought it was great. And, uh, yeah, it, I mean, you've got one coming pretty soon. And, Roberto, I mean, you're, you're on this show as a guest. Like, that's. Um, I, I don't know if you've actually been interviewed for anything, but I mean, I, I, I've, I've been interviewed a couple times. Uh, there was actually an episode of Ape It Life where Richard Cook. Uh, a good friend of mine, and also uh, a guy that he actually has a documentary recently came out, uh, Surviving Indie, and he's done a lot of indie panels. A really cool, amazing person. 
Uh, there was an episode, I think, where he interviewed me. I think that was a joke. Either he interviewed me or it was or Rick Foster. I forget which one of the two. Maybe both of them. I forget. Mm-hmm. It's, but there was an episode where of 8-Bit Life where the tables are turned and I get interviewed, uh, which I always thought was fun. Um, yeah. it's, it's interesting being interviewed, especially when it's a written piece, because there's a little bit of a different flow. Uh, versus an audio piece. I mean, t- you know, typically I do interviews a bit yeah. more casual, a bit more conversational. So I, I don't have to really worry about that. But when it comes to being one for text, it's a bit different in terms and of how you approach it. Jackie Hearn in the uh, in the chat room is saying that she interviewed me, and of course she did. I mean, I was on I was on What's Cooking, which is her her interview show. But right. it's, that's, that's one thing that all three of us have in common. Yeah, all three of us. Very true. We've all, all we've all been there. Right. And 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 again, being interviewed, it, it all depends on on how. You know what the final format of the interview is. If it's, a com- if it's audio or it's video, it's completely different from being a text one because typically mm-hmm. in a text kind of interview, you're sort of scribbling down the quotes. You're maybe recording it and then dictating it. Uh, I at one point was going to be on a radio program that uh, I think the bit got a bit cut just because of time. Um, but I, even then, I've been interviewed for that kind of stuff. And again, completely, you know, and, and and even that sort of thing, depending on what language I'm going to use. Like here, I can kind of curse, and here I can kind of be a little bit casual or joking. But let's say, for example, I'm, you know, going to be on an NPR piece or something like that. Well, I got to really, you know, reel it in and sort of yep. figure out and hone my points down to get my message across clearer. Now, one I, thing that I really liked about Fitz's interview of Amos, or at least, well, the article, the finished article, one, th- one of the things that I really liked is the way that he formats it. Like the, he's got segments and it's like, it's just this natural flow. Um, it's, it, I don't know. He, he asked great questions. He found uh, great people to get. Uh, I was almost said sound bites, uh, but get quotes from. <laughs> uh, it's it, like the format is just it's fantastic, and uh, I I want to encourage Fitz to keep doing stuff like that. Mm. Uh, I I think because I've I've read quite a bit of your your uh, medium posts, uh, Fitz, and I think your writing style is improving, and I want you I want to encourage him to continue to do that keep keep going dude it's it's really good stuff i'm going to take it a little bit of a different direction and i'm going to remind uh uh roberto that the first time you and i actually met in person you let me borrow your equipment that's to right interview tom that's right that was that was <laughs> in, uh it was during south by southwest there at the uh the fuck what was that bar called Darwin's Pub. Yes. Was it Darwin's Pub? Oh, okay, we're outside absolutely. Darwin's. I always thought we were out there outside the Jackalope for some reason, but no, um, Darwin's are right. You'll 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 quickly find that everything that Ritual Misery puts together is going to be outside Darwin's Pub. Like it's it's, it's <laughs> yeah. kind of our, our Austin staple. It's it's our it's it's, our it's, place. it's a decent bar. Uh, I mean, yeah. that, we'll that's right because it was it, you needed yeah that's right because you needed audio, uh, yep. and, and I, I needed to borrow a microphone or something because I forgot yep. I, I had forgotten a mic or something somehow so, that this, so and this I one snagged, happened. Yeah, I snagged one of Kent's mics. That you recorded, I interviewed him, and then I was like, "Okay, I'm out. Is that cool?" And you're like, "Oh yeah." And then it was, it was actually this very <laughs> ATR 2100. Well, because like for me, it's 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 funny as we talk about microphones because um, like my go-to handheld mic of choice is an Audix OM2, uh, but I mean Audio Technica doesn't make anything crappy either. Um, mm. I have I I use a, a turntable from them and other you know AT products as well. Actually, all my cables are Audio Technica. Um, XLR cable, whatnot. I mean, as I speak right now, I'm talking to a Rode Procaster. Here we go, talking to microphones. Um, but it's interesting. Um, so much you know, to I remember that was that, that sort of like emergency thing of like, we need to record this. Like, like well, I have XLR. Because we have like, like what, what do you get? You're able to do is like, dude, I got an XLR input here. We could we could rock this however you want to rock yeah. it. And it's just like, oh, you actually have a, a stuff. I'm like, yeah. I, I give you, you want the file now? And here I am monitoring audio because I'm like, well, this is my day job. You know, my 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 brushwood kind of job. So I'm like, cool. I, I like I can monitor audio if you want. I'm like, okay. Yeah. Because it's never, you know, you never think of like all well, these sort of factors. And and then it turns out that the next day I return the favor because you guys were one computer short for the Night Attack live show the next day. And I yep. happen to have an, a MacBook Air that I wasn't using. And yeah, like it was just... I got to use that to play all the sound effects and stuff like that. That was a uh, very that fortuitous. was a very challenging uh, live event because going into that, I didn't quite know what equipment I'd have on hand. Mm. Um, I didn't even know what the venue kind of provided or what would ha- happen. That was a very very. It, there are very few events I can say that tested my ability of of um, 
monitoring audio than that one because um, here's a little behind the scenes stuff. Even though it turned out great, and I th- and and you know, Brant and Bryce did an amazing job videotaping it, editing it down, and getting it presented. Uh, everything was recorded on one channel, uh, and I was like ramping it up and down that one channel, like just riding the the levels to make sure it was just some type of clean signal. Jeez. Oh my! It, it was it was fun. It was a very very uh, very very scary kind of thing. I learned a lot about how how i do my process uh in fact I, at the end of the night when everyone's like let's go party i'm like i'm gonna go home not because i, I not because i don't want to hang out with you guys but i just i just went through 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 audio hell and 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 you know trial by fire literally and i survived and i'd like to just relax right now uh oh. no because it, it turned out great I, I it was a fun time it was a blast and a half but it was one of those things just like this is this a lot more it was it was the kind of stress i had not been used to but as it turned out by doing scam school, I had like trained my entire life, you know, trained, you know, for a couple of years for doing like it became this like I can actually work a live board. I can actually do this because, you know, because, again, it, it, I, I know, you know, my job, at least when it came to doing does doing audio and even doing, you know, in terms of scam school is making sure to give the give Bryce and Brandt as clean of a signal as possible. Um, so that way they, they don't have to worry about this audio being blown out, this sort of being crap and there not being anything to survive of that, but they'd give them as best of a, of a job as I can given all the circumstances and hearing how that turned out, I was like, I'm, I'm, I'm glad it did turn out the way it did. And again, it was one of those things just like, I know how I did it and it was very stressful, but it, it worked yeah. out really well. That That's pretty awesome. This is, this would be a good time, Amos, I think to make an announcement about this year's South by Southwest. Oh, uh, but, um, so, uh, oh, yeah. so we, now we we're not going to have now full disclosure here we we don't have all of the details worked out just yet however but we do want to announce to people that one month from today the 9th of March in oh. Austin at an undisclosed location probably on 6th Street there is going to be the very first ever RMP live show scary we are scary. super excited about that um, and Maybe maybe a little bit nervous. I don't know. Like, is it ninety percent <laughs> nerves, ten percent excited, or is it like ten percent nerves, ninety percent excited? I've never quite known that equation. Um, <laughs> right. It's, it, I think it fluctuates between the two. But no, it's going to be super awesome. And I, we I'll can't tell you what. Do- when we arrive in Austin on Wednesday night, the the eighth, right? When we arrive in Austin on the eighth, uh, it's going to be one hundred percent excitement, zero percent nerves, and somewhere in there a smidgen of holy shit alcohol. Um, the day of. <laughs> <laughs> That's likely to change very, very much. So yeah, yeah. Alcohol is the anti-anxiety drug of choice, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, sure. <laughs> that, that's that's what they say. That's. <laughs> uh, but yeah. So next week, if everything goes right, next week, right here next Thursday on the Ritual Misery podcast, we will have full details, full details. of the show. We will give. We will reveal the location. Uh, we will tell you the time, and we will tell you kind of a. a now, uh, basic agenda of what we, the show is. We, going we to be. will we will tell you that if all goes well, it will be one of those events um, that ties into other things because apparently traditionally Thursday night is the pub crawl night. So we are not yes. gonna, we are not yes. going to interrupt that. Don't 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 worry no, about having this. This is going to be the pregame. Yeah, our show is going to be the pregame for the traditional Thursday night pub crawl. Yes. So, uh, so it, 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 it'll be that that's appropriately in, in yeah, Thursday a, night during South by Southwest interactive is if you flew in early, you go pick up your badge. If you have a badge in your respective, um, tract or, or whatnot, if you're, if you're not using a badge and, and you're trying to find a job, you do the startup pub crawl on Thursdays because F it, you know, the interact with, with, with startups and learn thing, learn a thing or two about a thing or two. Uh, and if you're not a you know, part of none of those things, you find something else to do because it's still dead and no one's here yet. <sighs> yep. Right. And, yeah. Right. Uh, no, uh, exactly. So, Roberto, we do a thing occasionally on this show um, that's called Hot Takes. Now, just to set you up for this, I need to make this very clear. This is going to limit how long you can talk about things. Okay. All right. So I can do that. Basically, I'm going to give you a subject. And you've okay. got roughly 10 seconds to talk about it. In fact, you have until you hear okay. that. Once you hear that, you stop, you get your next subject, and you go. And it goes about a minute. Amos, what do we got? 
You've got 60 seconds. Get your mind right. It's time for Hot Takes on the Ritual Misery Podcast. All right. All right. You ready? I think I'm ready. You just tell me whatever you want to say about this. Earthbound. Am I right? Awesome. So quick. (laughs) All right. South by so wasted. Am I right? Jackie Hearn, am I right? Yeah. (laughs) Chip Tunes, am I right? Fuck yes. (laughs) The Ritual Misery Podcast, am I right? Eh, it's okay. (laughs) Sounds perfect. We we figured it out. The best way to shut Roberto up is to give him a time limit. He will exceed. Mm -hmm. He will win it every single time. Yep. (laughs) Oh, my God. It's what you that learn. Was, it's what. You, it's one thing you learn. That's the quickest <clears throat> hot takes that we have ever done. You get sixty seconds. I think you did it in about sixteen. <laughs> but the point. Look, you. If you give me a time limit, I will get in, get out, and 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 do my thing. And that's that is all I need to do. The rest, because again, if you don't give me a time limit, fine. I'll talk my my mouth off and and do whatever it takes to fill those dead air. Because for me, dead air is the enemy. It is the thing that I must fill. And if it isn't filled, that means there's those moments in radio where you hate it. It sucks. Because right. you, you, you can tell, you know, in radio and in audio, you can tell dead air. You can cut that out in video because you get to edit and stuff like that. But you can hear the dead air, just the uh, um, uh, uh. Okay, the next song is going to be, you know, you can hear that and you and you question that and you, you hear any crappy thing. But if you give me a time limit, I'm like, all right, cool. I got to do it. Boom, boom, boom. Let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> right. Now, uh, ja- I, I hadn't actually thought about this until Jackie Hearn mentioned it a little while ago in the, in the chat room. But have you guys heard the latest iPhone rumors? No. I heard something about uh, wireless charging. Uh, wire. Uh, so, so I got I got most of this. I I read like five sites today. You know, Mac rumors, nine to five Mac, um, all this stuff. BGR, all the sites had had all this information, and they're looking at it costing over a thousand dollars. They're looking at having wireless charging. What? They're looking at having an OLED screen instead of LCD. They're looking at having three models, three different sizes, and the largest one, of course, being the more the most expensive one, the thousand dollar one. Having practically uh, end to end, top to bottom, full display, like like minimal bezel, like almost no bezel. What are your thoughts on that, Roberto? Are you an iPhone user? Uh, I mean, maybe, <laughs> you know, just 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 slightly potentially. I, I think yes, I, yes, I am. I think I have, uh, I'm also I think I have user, the same so case. Fuck. Actually, I, I think I have the same. Um, <laughs> The the large side, the one that's that's a thousand dollars. I mean, if they're just like getting you know bigger is better is more expensive. So let's like, see. Eventually, we're gonna be like, like let's see how much an Hello? iPhone is right now. Hello? Uh, and and not necessarily an iPhone that you get on a on a contract. So obviously, thousand dollars is not on uh, on a contract one. Like that's like the the actual phone itself. So let's say I was gonna buy. Let's say I was gonna buy an the, iPhone today. The, the, uh, the, the say, biggest buy... one, the iPhone seven. Uh, the iPhone seven plus. With 256 gigs of memory is 979, I believe. That's about close enough to a thousand with tax. You right. know, so it's a, it's you know it's about the same cost as as this. Um, I'm going to be flat out honest. I don't see them doing OLED right off the bat with iPhone 8. I do see them doing wireless charging. I do, if if they need the OLED to do the bezel, you know the the you know, edge to edge kind of thing, then yes, they'll do it. Cause that's kind of what that's sort of their, their MO and they need to kind of do something crazy. Um, a wireless charging. I see that they're going to do that. That makes a whole lot of sense. That's easy. You can still put a cable there anyways, just for, for the sake of not needing it kind of stuff. But that makes sense. Especially, you know, if you think of like the iWatch having a wireless charge, you know, magnetic charger of some sort, they've already kind of figured out how their sort of workflow and tech, uh, thing would work out, how they'd kind of make that in their, um, form factors and whatnot. The OLED one's the one I, I don't see because not because OLED isn't great. I think it would be better as a screen. I think especially if you think of like uh, how OLED ha- you know handles when lights hit on on it versus an LCD. You don't have to have as much brightness on there. You can cut down on battery usage, which is everybody's sort of dream when it comes to s- smartphones. 
is just man is it pricey because you have to cut it's one of those display formats that you have that takes a lot of work to get it to work right each time and to get it to manufacture right you have a little i think um i think the issue has been always been manufacturing so if they got that that sort of figured out then yeah they do it i again i i don't think a thousand i think a thousand for the largest model isn't as bad as everyone makes it because people don't quite what, know how much they pay for cell phones now what if a thousand dollars is the starting price the entry level price for the oled model for the oh because because that's Nobody's how i read it and that's why i bought it, it, it well why why i bought into it because a thousand dollars for the entry the 64 gig the, or the 32 gig the lowest lowest memory well because the thing is is that like like the, the the kicker when it comes to iphones um especially when it comes to to to, to tech the things that are are losing value um if you think about the iphone as as a product right you have um its screen you have memory and you have processor um, the things that are lowering in cost uh, is, is flash memory. You know, the flash memory is getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. Here, that's why, for example, when you buy a new phone, if you were kind of coming the generation, you see that the memory has doubled uh, on the base model from like 16 to 32, 32 to 64, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and now that Apple's sort of making their own chips, they figure out how to make the workflow, that kind of stuff. So they're not really doing, you know, they don't have to spend a whole lot of money on that now. They've got a 64 bit now. They can add more memory, all these sort of things to it. Um, so taking all that into account, I can see $1,000 being the base model with the OLED screen just because they can now add more RAM at least to the phone. Um, there's other kind of tech advances that can be added to it. Um, even if it's the base model, that doesn't mean it's going to be you know, the 16 gig or 13, 32 gig kind of thing because they're able to fit 64 gigabytes in there and it doesn't affect the cost too much. They'll put 64 gigabytes in the base model uh, and he, you know, just because they can, um, mm. that's what they do, uh, cause it doesn't matter. Um, it's what, what will matter for them. And the only reason they would do OLED, and this was important, um, is either a, it'll significantly increase battery life, which it will, but most importantly, if that's the only way they can try to get this, this bezel free, um, f phone, because even though I'm not an Android user, there is something kind of interesting about that kind of curved display that they had on the uh, on the some of the Samsung phones. I was like, that's kind of cool. I like the idea of the sort of you know edge thing. And if you can kind of get this sort of complete experience, it's, it's, it's all screen. That's kind of cool. Um, I think that's an interesting aesthetic, aesthetic and definitely an interesting kind of tech kind of thing. But so, it all really matters. If they can pull it down. Yeah. Well, Jackie in the chat wants to know if she she asked it to all three of us. If you had to get a new phone, if you had to buy a new phone right now tonight. Because like all your all your phones right. are broken, you had to get a new phone tonight. What would you What would you get? I'd probably get an iPhone Seven. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm so I'm so much in, into the in the Apple um, yep. camp yep. at this point that I'm going to be the so boring easy. person and say exactly what Roberto said because I, what, I've actually considered would, would upgrading. You, would from you the get 6S the, the, the iPhone Seven, iPhone Seven Plus, or the iPhone SE? Which one would you go for? Because because we we already know she's 7. already invested in the iPhone system. She has an iPhone. Well, she, whatever the she whatever has. the latest iPhone is at this point. Um, if it's yep. the SE, then the, then then that's it. Most likely a Plus because I I, I do want a, a a bigger phone. Um. Now, one of those two things. She she's I'm mentioning get the she's mentioned I'm not she wants getting to get it plus, because she right? dropped it because the screen cracked and stuff like that. I would just go get a new screen, honestly. That's the best seriously no <laughs> shit the best way to go. But if you're going to upgrade, I would go with the 7, I would go with the 7 plus and I would go with the middle memory increment because Yeah. You, like the 32 what, well, what no, or no, what is it? The 64, 64 now I think is the middle one. I think yeah. the Yeah. I think the 128 for the 7 is the middle. Is it? See, there yeah. we go. All right, let's. Really? Let me, here, I'll, I'll I'll look right now. I was just right now looking at phones. Yep. Uh, yeah, one twenty eight is like the 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 iPhone seven plus minimum capacity for buying a, a new phone without a carrier. So one twenty eight. So there we, so go. we go. So already already we're already seeing one twenty eight you know, two fifty six whatever's whatever's in the budget. But I would go with the plus because right now, in my opinion, you either go with the plus or the SE. Like if you're looking yeah. for felt, small, powerful, you go with the SE. If you're going for give me some give me some shit. Uh, practically a tablet replacement. You go with the uh, the plus, and you just leave the middle guy for Kent because he's the only yeah. middle guy that I know. Yeah, there you go. So no, see, I need my phone to fit in my pocket. Damn it! You need to wear uh, bigger fucking plus? pants, man. Gain some weight. So um, <laughs> I was I was I was thinking about it, <laughs> and, and I'm not gonna wear cargo pant cargo pants to my white collar job. <laughs> Whatever, dude. Um, I was thinking about it, and I think I think it's about time that because. 
Apple has had a Apple's had been the pre the premium phone for a premium phone experience for a while, and then now it's like kind of tapered off and it's, it's you know running uh, equal to the Android equivalents, you know. And I think they want to, and I, I think it's the time that they have a premium model of iPhone. So you have your normal iPhones, got the normal upgrades, all this other stuff. And now it's about time that they have that next model up. That holy shit, this is the next, the next tier. Because they can, because they're Apple, and they're gonna spe- it's gonna sell. And if you throw OLED in there, you it doesn't matter what the price is because it's OLED. Everybody's gonna want it. You're gonna see it, and you're gonna be like, yes, that. Well, because um, OLED is a is a screen format that when you see it, pops at you. It's it, it's it, amazing. It, it's not a screen. It's it's a. It's a display that in it, yeah. it enraptures your eyes immediately. Like uh, the, OLED uh, is, is uh, one yeah. of the best. It's it's one of the hardest things to, to make, but it is one of the better screen experiences. And and that's like I said, the only reason like I would see Apple doing that because that's the kind of thing that you go and you say, oh, you know. And again, a thousand dollars is not on contract. You know, right. like on contract, they're probably like two hundred, three hundred tops kind of thing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Just yeah, yeah. just um, the but, nature of of, of that. Two ninety nine. And, and, yeah. I, and I think I think OLED has been around long enough. They've got finally got the kinks worked out yep. enough that Apple is yep. ready to invest in it. I can they see let this Samsung being... work out the kinks. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly. the idea. You but, let someone else but Apple it now. And Samsung, no, and that, Samsung's that's smart. battery that's factory so, just I mean, lit that's, that's fire. Smart because who cares? <laughs> like, it's yeah, it's ridiculous. But anyway, so, I mean, again, it's, one it's thing one that I heard it kind of amused me. So one of the things about wireless charging. They're afraid that the iPhone is going to uh, overheat because of that. Right. Well, just I guess based on I don't know where this supposedly. Well, no, no, they, they are they are right in in terms of their uh, and I can say from from just I have a a battery pack that actually does wireless charging on on here for it, uh, and it does tend to get a little bit hotter uh, at that. Better if it's a battery getting hotter or that. It. It'll be and obviously wireless charging will only matter. I think. What wireless charging will be is sort of the um, if you think of of the equivalent of of that or sort of the idea of of docking your phone of like when you when you sort of had like a dock or whatever you just sort of sit down and leave it there. I think that's where wireless charging is going to be used. I think there's still going to be some type of port, um, mainly because you still got to send data to this thing every so often. And and while yes, uh, they'd love to get rid of that lightning port. There's other things they use for that lightning port. There's other things that hook up that lightning port, and it's really not that much of a it's not that big of a port to be honest. Mm-hmm. Um, they may switch it to be a USB-C kind of port just because they're trying to go that way with with, uh, with lightning. I doubt it just because of the nature of, of things. Well, a, um, a USB-C and a, and a lightning port essentially use the same amount of room internal exactly. to the device. So there's no... Right, exactly. You know. The, 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 om- the only and USB-C is isn't, is... USB-C doesn't have the encrypted uh, the, the encrypted validation key that, that lightning has. So there's... Right. That, that's so, yeah. kind of the, why they went that way. Makes sense. And again, the it, thing it, that it, amused it, me about that news, though, about the um, you know the concerns that it, that came up with the overheating was that they pointed out that uh, Samsung also has the patent on overheating phones. <laughs> <laughs> it, it'll it, it's one again. It will be an engineering thing. And again, Apple's not one to say, well, if we can't get it work, you know, they're one to say if we can't get it working quite yet, we won't put it in the phone. They're not afraid to not to hold back on certain things. It's and, always and, next year. Well, because the one thing, the one thing I think out of that phone is, if it doesn't wireless charging, fine. Um, that OLED may, may be the make or break one, especially if they have to use it to get the edge to edge kind of bevel, and and just for the idea of it popping the way it would, it was like that would be an yeah. amazing screen. You especially know, that would especially be phenomenal. Like, yeah, OLED done Apple way. Oh. Yeah, that's why it'll it'll show it, it it'll just, show kind of like showcase that. It's just one of the things like you see an OLED thing. So, it's like, yeah, it's so like here's beautiful. here's my account number, here's my routing number. Like just take the money, <laughs> just just take whatever you want, whenever you want. It's there for you. Just go ahead, just give me the damn OLED Apple way. Um, <laughs> hey, uh, Dialogue three D. This is something I had read about. Um, a little little take on Wolfenstein. Um, it's pretty amazing, actually. Yeah. Um, so this is a, uh, and I kind of came on this because like this part of like the pre show, which is uh, a prep. You had sent me a sheet, and it's like you know articles you saw, and I literally went to Polygon and sort of sort of read some stuff, and this came up. Um, so obviously, there's been a recent question on the internet um, as of as of this past couple of, of months 
uh, the idea, is it okay to punch a Nazi? Uh, obviously spurned on by the uh, punching of, um, uh, what's the guy's name? I forget. The Richard kid, the, Spencer. The, Richard uh, Spencer. The upstanding uh, U.S. citizen. You know, and, he, and he's kind of a, uh, you know, a, a, a uh, I think, you know, white supremacist, not really the, the, the most uh, racially, um, you know. Uh, I, I, think, I think Richard Spencer is the, the guy that coined the term alt-right. Yes, and I won't now. I, I won't politically go as far as to call him a Nazi, but you know, and, and there are very there are parallels to his viewpoint to what the Nazi Party had. So we'll just sure. leave it at like that. Uh, but one of the most famous video games made by id Software, uh, and you know, the company that's now part of Bethesda has made such hits as Doom. Uh, obviously, you know, there's you know other kind of things. But one of them was first one of the, one of the first 3D games, not the first one, uh, was Wolfenstein 3D. Uh, yeah. And if you don't know about anything about Wolf Design, it's set during it's set during World War II, but it has very little to do with World War II than anything else set in World War II because that game gets to the point where you're fighting Robo Hitler, uh, which is amazing and awesome and, and <laughs> glorious. You're fighting no, a giant no, fucking me mechanized Hitler, wrong. like yes. Correct me if I'm wrong. Wolfenstein 3D is the first FPS, right? I don't think it is, and that's why uh, this is where I get kind of confusing. Well, the, it's okay, like, the, well, maybe the first one that became popular, like mainstream. right. It, it let, it, you know, it, it is one of the. In, it is in the pantheon of I, FPSs. You know, I, I almost buddy. used mainstream, but only to some of us. Like, <laughs> well, no, we... no, it, it's it, it's because this is me being like, this is me saying I don't know off the top of my head if it is the first, and I don't want to get you guys a comment. It's one of the first. Let's say it's one of the first. It's definitely one of the first. Yeah, that's why I say yeah. it's one of the first. It's one of the first FPSs. You know, it, it is definitely in the pantheon of those it's, from things it's like. It's the first one Quake. that I played that actually felt like a real game and not like some janky simulation of what somebody yes. thought it could have been like it was yeah, the first no, one that was really it, playable is, it is a, for a very interesting game and stuff so anyways uh, a guy and I, i'm gonna get the uh the, the mod this uh, specifically it is the entitled mod is dialogue th uh, 3d um and the idea of it is wolfenstein game but as you play it as you start playing the game and you start walking through and as you're going to shoot um different um uh characters uh, and different sort of, uh, uh, you know, Nazis, if you will, um, you end up having to, you end up actually, um, I'm right now playing it myself, and if you attack it, whatever, <laughs> like, say, you know, Nazi comes at you, about to shoot him, because that's what you do in the game, you shoot Nazis, because they're attacking you and shooting you, it actually pops up dialogue in front of you, asking, like, you know, you should be doing this, or something, you know, like that, it sort of makes all these kind of uh, ideas of stuff. So, like, you know, like I'm right now, uh, you know, trying to find a Nazi, and it says here, uh, has violence, like, like, it pops up a dialogue window, like, has violence stopped you from doing these sort of things? And it's, it, it's interesting on, 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 uh, as a commentary, because, you know, when it comes to video games, I think it's important to talk about uh, and sort of bring up is, uh, you know, talk about when it comes to, to to video games that you can sort of send a message that you can kind of talk about things and sort of in a very abstract, interesting way. Mm -hmm. Um, and again, I like that, that someone decided, let me, you know, let me take the, a very, very famous game for shooting Nazis and, and sort of apply this logic that we, we've kind of come to the idea, uh, uh, of these things, you know, like, like all these sort of concepts of, of, of where, where does speech end and hate begin kind of thing. Yeah. And, and it was really cool. I thought it was a really cool, um, mod in that this is a great way of making a commentary and stuff. And this is what video games should be about is, I'm, is I'm, I'm just going to say can... that if, if we ever live in a world where I can't just punch Nazis, like I don't, <laughs> I don't know. There has, no, to, I, well, there has to be a last vestige of, of, of anger that I can just, vent against and and because well, i mean nazis on. like like have what's funny about uh, you know about because this is where we, we start talking about video games and kind of you know how you do things um because like one of the the quick ways of making a video game is sort of having you know that you, you have to have something that the player is going against whether it be you know uh, bowser has kidnapped your your princess uh, you know, you, you are Lolo traveling through a bunch of mazes trying to, you know, rescue the other pink blob, or you're just, you know, a couple of dinosaurs that blow bubbles, and, and your mission is to try to somehow, cap, you know, save your girlfriends and become real boys. Um, sorry, that's the plot of uh, that's the plot of, of Bubble Bobble for those who didn't know. Um, and so I like that that again, that if you break this, yeah, welcome to my world. Um, but I like that that they did this and and they, they talk about the idea because it's one of those things we you know when you look at 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 video games like it's very cut and dry, very clean and whatever, and the world's really not quite like that. 
Um, but it's a very cool mod of just like, well, let's ask those questions. So let's let's put this the kind of thing because we talk about you know how useless sometimes all this stuff is when it comes to like having a constructive dialogue with people that don't like to have constructive dialogues. And I think that's what sort of kind of comes up is that when you try to have these kind you know constructive dialogues in in it it kind of gets in the way, not because there this can't is, be any constructive, but because they don't want to have that. This is, okay, so talking about a video game uh, as, you know, making a statement, opening up dialogue, this is the perfect argument for a video game as art. Oh, yeah. Which has been an argument for a while, which uh, to me, it's a no fucking brainer. Video <laughs> games are definitely art. I mean, oh, yeah. it, well, it fits I, all they, of the, the criteria to be art, whether it's a, you know, you've got uh, painting, you've got, um, you know, writing novels, you've got mm -hmm. video games, you know, the, all of these things are uh, things that challenge your notions, things that, uh, you know, make you think about other things, whether it's, a, you know, transport you to another place, uh, question your beliefs, what have you. Video games absolutely fit in that exact same, uh, you know, criteria model as paintings or novels. I think the question sometimes comes, and this is something that uh, Doug Walker, I think that's his last name, uh, from he's, he's typically known as the the nostalgia critic, uh, had brought up in a video way back when. Uh, either Doug Walker did, I think, is it Doug or or James Rolfe? I forget which one brought it up. James Rolfe from Angry Video Game Nerd. Um, yeah. The yeah. idea isn't so much of is video games art, because it is, and you're absolutely right, no matter what you do, whether it's a, a stick drawing, whatever is art. It's the idea is, is it, you know, art with a capital A. Is it fine art? Is it something uh, that that has this? You know, did they? I would, that I would argue that can be. I know, and I, I I agree as well. I I totally agree. Again, you're preaching the choir here. You're not. You're talking to somebody that that's <laughs> that kind of, you know, uh, it's really deep, near deep in this and has played things that are very artistic. I would I would you know I would, I would love to hear someone argue to me why Journey is not artistic and why that isn't a a beautiful piece of art. You know, I would love to hear someone argue why it isn't because I don't think that that's even possible. I would love someone to tell me why it is the simplicity of, of Hyperlight Drifter and how it, it conveys a story without any dialogue. You know, at and, and, Vincent four oh four. Have <laughs> arguments. Yeah, if you have if you if you can tell me why Flower isn't a pretty game, then you know, and isn't beautiful and and is serene and 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 invokes all those stuff. We may, you know, I would love to hear why, because that would be an interesting kind of discussion, and and I'd love to hear your, your things you back it up with, because that'd be kind of an interesting dialogue, um, because a lot of this stuff is just there's such there's so many things when it comes to when video games do it right, and again, you could argue that yes, things like Wolfenstein, things like even you know even things like you know Doom and Quake and all that stuff like that, it's kind of you know maybe not as artistic and whatnot and things like that, but we wouldn't argue movies are are not art, even though we have you know. Uh, movies such as as La La Land and and Zootopia right next door to movies like John Wick or or even you know Logan and let's sure. say these aren't bad these are not to say that they're bad any you know either of them are bad it's just me being a very you know showing the wa the the broad spectrum of this other medium and well, saying well I mean it's the different it's it's the difference between uh, Leonardo da Vinci and Vincent Van Gogh they're not the same genre of right you know I mean they're both they're both oil paintings but they're not the same. You know, and this is the same with like the movie. I mean, it's the same. You know, you're using celluloid to project something onto a screen for us to look at, but it's not the same. You know, and it's I don't know. There's there's a lot of equivalence. Uh, but we just now mentioned that you are at Vincent four hundred four on Twitter. Yes. Where else can people? get a hold of you or or see what you're all about oh i'm easy to find if you want to just head over to cosmic radio tv forward slash 8-bit life and watch my podcast there you can hear me talk for another hour and and realize that time constraints are the best thing that i have going for me <laughs> when it comes to stuff <laughs> all right um, amos where are you at dude at ethan k on the twitter uh but uh, real quick i want to make sure that we we don't forget this week again to point yes. out that we have. I actually had a segue planned for this, but go ahead. On, on, on DiamondClub.tv, home to all of us, we have a new show. Have a drink. Um, it's a podcast about drinking beer. Like I don't, I don't know what else we can say about it. It's just, it's amazing. So, uh, yeah, they, they're a monthly show. I'm not sure if they're gonna stick to their monthly format or if they're gonna do like a biweekly thing. Or I don't, I don't know. But stay tuned. Check so, them out. They Sundays are on Twitter at Have a Drink Show. But they are currently doing shows on Sundays at 6 p.m. Eastern. I think it's once a month. Don't hold me to that. Uh, but check them out. They are super awesome people. Four of the, the coolest people that I met when I was in Cincinnati uh, last year. 
um, way awesome. They are super knowledgeable about beer. They're entertaining. They're funny. Check them out. That's Have a Drink Show. Um, and Kent, what about you? I, if you're if you're interested in what I have to say about beer, you can either read my full form reviews on ratebeer.com by looking up username Del Noche, or I've recently joined the world of Untapped. What the hell took me so long? Uh, <laughs> but I'm Del Noche on there to the social uh, beer drinking app. Yeah, if you're a beer guy and you're not on Untapped, that's kind of a like a, a, a strange oddity. <laughs> right. All right. Um, exactly. We we have one last thing to cover before we're out of here. Uh, we, we talked a little bit about a lot of things tonight, but what it really comes down to is people have hopes and dreams. Yes. And some people have different aspirations in life. And we, we took a little bit of a spirit of Austin and we, in, in, in your honor. And we, we, uh, we, we tried to grab some of the headlines, some of the main headlines of art in Austin. And yes. Kent's going to read us a little bit of a review on some of the things that are just amazing about Austin. Kent, go ahead. Right. So, <clears throat> so Roberto, uh, we, we talked about a lot of things during the last hour and some change. And you might notice some uh, uh, similarities to some things that we, we talked about during the show. All right. So here we go. Tom Brady Theaters offers a hexadecimal program of foreign sports balls never before seen in American pop. The first film to be shown will be Henry and the Politics. This is the KG love story of a man and his gas station toothpaste. It will be shown monetarily until the end of the dead air. Appearing in our OLED theater for the next three times... Oh, for the next three time limits, is Lady Gaga. That very tech star of stage, screen, and battery. She will be appearing with our Japanese repertory company in nightly performances of William Shakespeare's wireless comedy, A Midsummer Night's Port. Tickets can be purchased now at the iPhone office by telephone, fax, or bezel-free card. You gotta watch out for them bezel free cars, man. They get you. So, so there's only one thing that you need to add to that to make it fully Austin compatible. Actually, maybe a <laughs> okay. few things, but at least two things. One, you need to make sure that there's vegan option food. Ah, noted, noted. Uh, and two, what startup is sponsoring it? <laughs> Good point. Good point. We will get on that. We will report after on that. that. Solid gold. That's that's a South by <laughs> that's a, that, that's a South by film premiere if I ever heard one. Hey, uh, next week we have Clyde Harvey, aka Poodle Puncher, coming on the show. You uh, might know him from the Vod Squad, uh, Diamond Club Movie Night. Uh, he's a, a persistent chat realm presence. Uh, if you watch Night Attack, um, cool dude, all around, just awesome guy. He is our guest next week. So join us for that. Um, and, of course, uh, you can find all of our links and everything else having to do with our show on richermisery.com. We want to give a special shout-out to Kevin McLeod for allowing us to use your theme music for the beginning and the end. Pretty awesome stuff over there on comptech.com. Uh, thank you for listening or watching. This has uh, been another one of your Ritual Misery podcasts. See ya. Club hopes you have enjoyed this broker. <laughs> oh man, that was awesome. I, yeah, I gotta thank tell you this you, Roberto. This is the first Not time even a problem. this is the first time I've been the point of failure on this. So y'all continue chatting for some uh, post show love. I will return immediately because I have some business to take care of.